A wise man once said, inside every man there are two wolves. And it's this proverb that's supposed to be about inner conflict and the whole thing is about which wolf you feed or whatever. I usually stop listening once the wise man says something about wolves. I've never actually heard a wise man say this actually. I think I just saw this on a t-shirt that was being worn by some overweight dad at an amusement park whose kids were running around and screaming. Not sure if the tired dad with a proverb about wolves on his shirt uh, had everything figured out, but I think there's still something to derive here. Inside every melee held in ring PvP here, there are two wolves. One strength, the other dexterity. Uh, you might say, okay, but what about intelligence builds, faith builds, quality builds, or arc builds? And if you'd say all that, I'd just start gesturing for you to close your mouth and zip it. I'm the one who's making the YouTube video here, buddy, not you. Since well before the Dark Souls series, dating back to Dungeons and Dragons, strength and dex builds are supposed to pose this like yin and yang of melee builds in games. I, I think that's true. I I've never actually played Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, many people have tried to get me into Baldur's Gate 3 and just bounce so hard off that game. But anyways, uh, for our understanding uh, as Dark Souls players, or as like from softy enjoyers, um, strength tends towards slower, high damage in heavy weapons, and dexterity tending to be for fast and agile weapons that get most of their damage from numerous hits instead of a few. But you already know this, you're watching my nerd channel about nerd builds for the PvP niche of a primarily single player game. But my overall point with this video is that I never really gave pure dex or pure strength a try in Elden Ring, and I finally did for both at rune level 72. My one caveat is that the strength build has 16 intelligence, because there's like four really cool strength weapons in this game that just randomly have intelligence requirements. So maybe it's not a true pure strength build, but the only spells I can cast on it are Night Maiden's Mist for dudes who want to just sit in a room and not play the game. There's also one other spell, uh, but that will remain unseen for now. Inside every dex build, there are two weapons. One, a katana, and the other, also another katana. I find it extremely difficult to make a dex build in this game and not give it a katana. Even builds that don't really need it end up getting a katana at some point. And of course, a pure dex build is no exception. This is the point where I'd usually say, like, here are the stats for my build, and I'd show you, like, what I have equipped and stuff like that. Uh, but I forgot to take any of the footage uh, before I changed this build. So uh, instead, I'll just kind of walk you through it verbally. Uh, how I put these builds together, basically, is I start with, like, the Vagabond class most of the time. Um, and that's what I just had at rune level 72 in the first place. But I essentially just get the uh, bare minimum strength requirements for the weapons I want to use, and then I get just the right amount of endurance for being able to equip any of these weapons, plus the fashion that I want. I give myself, quote unquote, enough vigor, and then I just pump everything else into dexterity. The idea behind this build is that I'm trying to use weapons that make my character dance or flow through combat easily. I kind of named this character like the Blue Dancer in my head, and I think I chose some other name uh, relating to like a, a Greek siren. Um, it was not a great name. I don't quite remember what it was at this point. But the cornerstone for achieving this concept of being this blue dancing build was the offhand Zamora Curved Sword, which has these wonderful flowing light attacks that have a ton of forward momentum and also make your character, like, do a little spin. Uh, the Zamora Curved Sword is a curved greatsword, which means that its R2s are fast and have hyper armor. It's short, it's uninfusable, and does not proc frost very quickly, but nonetheless, it is a curved greatsword and thus is quite good. Like many things in Elden Ring, its Ash of War is absurd, as Zamor Ice Storm will proc Frost and then just continue to tear away at your opponents. The Storm has fast startup hyper armor and very little recovery, making it a superb trading tool, especially against uh, players who think Claws are a weapon class that is fun in this game. And what I really wanted to do with it is pair it with the flowing curve sword with that dancing R2. Sadly, that sword is extremely short and doesn't do very good damage, and to be honest, the R2 is kind of unusable against more than one opponent in this game, as it locks you into place for far too long and is easily interruptible. It's the perfect setup for playing with people that you know, or dueling with someone else who has a fun build, or even just for just fighting players you know you're better than, but just kind of want to style on. But for invasions, it's really not a great setup, even with an Ash of War like Sword Dance on it. I should mention Sword Dance also has an extremely similar startup to this weapon's R2, which allows you some pretty fun mix-up potential, and is a perfect marriage of Ash of War and weapon moveset. But again, for invasions, the Flowing Curve Sword is not your best option out there. 
In that same vein, another setup I should mention that is extremely fun but not at all that practical is Offhand Zamor and Main Hand Frozen Needle. The issue with the needle is that it essentially lacks the ability to keep multiple players off you unless you're willing to two-hand the Zamor frequently, which is definitely an option, uh, but isn't kind of the point of this setup. But all of the fun of this build is the free projectiles you get from the Frozen Needle are too. The more well-known weapon that does this is the Wing of Estelle, uh, but there are a few key differences here. Unlike the Wing, this weapon's projectiles fire even on the faint backsteps, meaning you can backstep away from your opponents while hitting them with a projectile R2, then follow it up with a backstep R1 that has tons of forward momentum. The downside here is that you can find yourself backstep fainting a little too often, and much like curved swords, that same weapon on thrusting swords does not have iframes. I really love this setup, but at rune level 72 with plus 15 weapons, the damage on the Frozen Needle is quite underwhelming for a level range where you need to be a little bit mean to succeed. So what I ended up using on my main hand far more often was a plain old keen infused Uji Katana with Unsheathed, which is just a little too basic for me. Katanas are like the definitive Elden Ring weapon. Uh, the one Ash of War you can put on them that you can't put on anything else is unsheathed and it does insane damage. And all the weapon class seems to be really good for are spamming attacks, like running attacks, running R1s, running R2s, which are some of the best in the game. And just the standing R1s are extremely spammable. And it's just all a little too basic for me. What I ended up pivoting to instead of the Uchi was actually the uh, Dragon Scale Katana, which mostly just looked really cool and matched the blue color scheme of my armor. Yes, does this sword match my outfit is a very real question I am constantly asking myself while making these builds. What kind of disillusioned me about this build in general was that I ended up relying far more on the running attacks and the spam of the Katana, rather than my offhand Zamor Curve Sword, in large part due to the latency of the people I was fighting. The Zamor is a slow weapon that doesn't do great damage, but it has this incredible forward momentum that I've mentioned that makes it quite useful, but even when I would space out my attacks perfectly with its superior reach, I would get nothing but ghost hits on my opponents, who are simply too latent to be hit with those attacks. Quite literally, on the other hand, uh, nobody in this game is too latent to be hit by a flurry of running attacks from a weapon that has two of the best running attacks in the game, so that's why the katana ended up in my main hand most of the time. And while this build had some very fun invasions, I sadly just felt like it kind of defaulted to like your old run-of-the-mill katana build, which really wasn't the outcome or playstyle that I had hoped for. In the future, I'll probably just start using the Zamor Curve Sword more, because I just really like that weapon, and it's also pretty good two-handed as well. But essentially, I was just kind of bored with this build and uh, decided to retool it to something else entirely. The last thing I will say about this build is that I was able to use one particular katana though. And let me tell you, the hand does hand things regardless of what rune level you're using it at. This phantom takes 1400 damage through the full combo, and probably would have taken more without the bubble, and probably would have taken even more, but they just ran out of health there. I sent them a brief apology shortly after this incident. Inside every strength build, there are only two stats that matter. One poise, the other hyper armor. 
Is Hyper Armor a stat? It might as well be in this game. It's not, by the way. Hyper Armor is stored in the cloud like virtual decks or the extra ping caused by FromSoft's implementation of easy anti-cheat on PC. Poise also barely matters to me anymore too. Like it helps you poise through weapon backswings I guess now? That's neat, but I'm always getting peppered with ghost hits from so many small arms and tiny projectiles that I just assume I have no poise most of the time anyways. So like, even if I went out of my way to make sure I hit all my specific breakpoints, I've probably been hit by a spell or projectile that's lowered my overall poise health, and I'm not about to try to calculate my poise health on the fly with this many projectiles flying across my screen at one time. So I just don't bother with it. I just grab the armor I think looks cool, make sure my weapons don't make me fat roll, and call it a day. The stats for this build are pretty much based around two questions. Can I one-hand the golem halberd? And can I equip the ruins greatsword without fat rolling? And that's it. My lore idea for this build was that it was going to be this meteorite blacksmith who makes absurdly large swords, hence why I'm wearing EG's helm and using the meteorite fans. The only other thing I did here was to give myself 16 intelligence so I could use said Ruins Greatsword, as well as the Star Scourge Greatswords. Uh, the Star Scourge Greatswords uh, pretty much just do one thing, they uh, pull people into holes or throw them off ledges. That's, uh, that's kind of all they really do, so uh, since we're here let's just queue up the Star Scourge Greatswords montage. So strength build's biggest advantage is their big damage, yes, but really it's their hyper armor. I found that good, quote unquote, good builds in Elden Ring kind of just boil down to like three main things, uh, poking, hyper armor, and projectiles. And strength build's strongest suit seems to fall into that hyper armor niche. Let's get the boring part of this build out of the way first so we can move on to the actually fun part of this particular strength build. The boring part is of course great swords. I'd have to imagine that the best strength build in the game is just a singular, heavy, iron-infused greatsword, as you get two different fast attacks with hyper armor and regular two-handed R1s and two-handed R2s that all do pretty great damage regardless of your rune level. Okay, maybe the best strength build in the game might actually be something like power stance heavy pikes or power stance heavy lances, or something equally brain dead and full of schmovement like the shunter. But I'm not tuned into what people who treat this absurd game like a fighting game are doing, so I'm just going to assume it's Heavy Iron Greatsword and call it a day. So I started using that, but wanted to make the build a little bit more interesting for myself, so I was going through possible offhand weapons that might be fun, and ended up opting for something completely useless, another Greatsword. Power Stance Greatswords are not good, their moveset is slow, they don't have any absurd moves like Power Stance Katana Crouch Attacks or Power Stance Curve Sword Running Attacks or Power Stance Straight Sword and Spear L1s. Are you picking up on the theme here? All they have is damage, but sometimes that's just enough in this silly game. A running, jumping, or standing L1 is a fine heal punish, but more often than not you're better off just two-handing one of those bad boys and leaving the other on your back. My advice here uh, is not actually about any sort of playstyles or anything like that, it's to use the Banish Knight Greatsword as your offhand, uh, because when you two-hand your, your main hand greatsword, you get to put the Banished Knight greatsword on your back, and it has this awesome scabbard and hilt that will look fantastic on the back of any tarnished warrior. 
When I got bored with this setup, I started using offhand lance for some poking pocket hyper armor, and that worked out pretty well. There are some fun combos you can pull off alternating between L1 and R2 with a main hand greatsword that are kind of neat. It kind of became my go-to against passive katana people who I couldn't really afford to trade with and just needed to stop in their tracks with a lance L1 poke and then roll catch with a greatsword R2. Okay, boring part is over. I know what you're all here for, right? You're here to see those big colossal swords, right? That's what gets the people going, I am told. I think colossal swords are fantastic. I love almost every single colossal sword in this game, and I think the designs and movesets on them do a good job of differentiating themselves from each other. Except, of course, for the Gugs, which is just better than every other colossal sword in every way imaginable because Miyazaki really likes Berserk. I didn't love Colossal Swords in Dark Souls 3 because I felt like the two-hit combo system made them a little bit boring and kind of one-dimensional to play with against a lot of opponents. Uh, but in Elden Ring, they encourage a lot more aggression because they have so many more viable attacks. You can also make trades by just holding down R2 and letting people run right into an attack that absolutely flattens their asses. Colossal Swords are so good in this game, and yet, and yet, they're also just really not a good fit for how this game is balanced, due in large part to the state of status buildups in PvP. With the way Hyper Armor currently works, I feel that Colossal Swords are well balanced in terms of moveset, Hyper Armor startup, and damage. But may America have mercy upon your soul if you run into a single Verduvia, or a Claw user, in the party that you're fighting. Colossal Swords have all this good Hyper Armor on all these slow attacks, and yet, if you get a single status effect crocked on you, it immediately cancels your hyper armor regardless of what move you're performing. When Elden Ring first launched two years ago, they had this absurd system where if you procced a status effect with the swing of a weapon, it put your opponent in hit stun long enough for another guaranteed hit on most weapons. This was a completely insane design choice that they fortunately toned down, but haven't entirely removed, where now getting a status effect procced on you cancels whatever action you were doing before. And I suppose I'd be fine with this system if status effects didn't build up so goddamn fast. Like, any large cold-infused weapon will proc frost on you in like two hits. A bleed out might take three. And that's not even mentioning ghost hits, which will build those same status effects even when you dodge these attacks. So it becomes quite difficult to swing your very large sword and make trades when there is a phantom with a Reduvia who will bleed you out in two blood blades and will turn that trade you were about to make into an instance where you just eat whatever you're going to trade with right to your face. Watch this clip where I bleed out twice in two seconds because I tried to stamp, sweep, blood, flame, star fists. That's a ridiculous sentence. Stamp, sweep, blood, flame, star fists. Moral of the story is just to not engage with anything with blood flame on it because there is no escaping the bleed out on that. Seriously, the state of status effects in this game is pretty absurd. Uh, either let's tone down how easy it is to proc a status on somebody, or we can fix ghost hits as well. Like, fixing both I might might even be overkill. I would just like to see like one fix or the other. Um, most likely ghost hits, because that's been plaguing us forever. But man, status effects across the board just build up way too fast. My conclusion is that Elden Ring would be a fantastic game for Colossal Swords if they just removed katanas entirely from the game. I mean, nearly every party that you might encounter has one of the three katanas that violate the Geneva Conventions, and also for some reason, literally every katana in this game has a status effect buildup. I would say I hate katanas as a whole, but I have been watching Shogun and thus I get why people want to use them, because they look badass as hell. I say all that knowing that if I were to ever wield a katana IRL, I'd look like Mac from Molly's Sunny trying to demonstrate how to stop a school shooter with a katana. But nonetheless, I get it. I will note that I really, really hate how much time I've devoted to talking about katanas on this build. Shamefully, I shall now move on to the final, but by far the most fun topic of this video. Did you know that the Golem Halberd has Charge 4th on it? For some reason, I didn't, and it slaps, and I love this thing, and it's beyond goofy. The only catch is that you can only have Charge 4th on the Golem Halberd if you leave it uninfused, which is fine, because in order to one-hand it, you have to have 36 strength, 
and that's kind of all the scaling that you need in the first place anyways. Now, remember that 16 intelligence I said was only for those two colossal swords and occasionally Night Maiden's Mist? Well, I lied. It's also for Unseen Blade, and putting Unseen Blade on the Golem Halberd is maybe my favorite aspect of this build, because it's just the extra little mind game you can play with your opponents. Like, where is the hitbox on this weapon? I have no idea either, but it's probably going to hit my opponents, because I'm locked onto them. The Golem Halberd in general is one of my favorite types of weapons that FromSoft has in their games, that being weapons that borrow movesets from other weapon classes. So while the Golem Halberd has the standing, rolling, and running R1s of a lot of other colossal weapons, it also has the Great Spear sweeping R2s, and a two-handed Great Sword and Great Axe running R2. I would demonstrate what those movesets look like, but my blade is currently unseen. And to round out this section, Charge Forth is a very fast Ash of War to put on a weapon the size of the Golem Halberd, making it a mix-up attack that my opponents literally cannot see coming. Anyways, that is about all I have for this video today. I think I'll just let the rest of this video just be clips of me using Unseen Bladed Golem Halberd, because that's just good, clean fun. So that's all from you guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.